and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Lord, we're here. We're here at the altar, oh God. And Lord, what we need to do right now, we need to hear from you, Lord God. And Lord, hearing comes by the word of God. So, Lord, as we open up your word right now, Lord Jesus, give us ears to hear, a heart to understand, and a will to do, Lord Jesus. Father, continue to cover us, continue to be with us, oh God, and continue to reveal your will to us, we pray. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name, and the people of God said, amen, amen, amen. Those of you that know me a little bit know I love to give glory to God, so would you give God, one more praise offering. Yes, amen. There's two things that I can think of that bring joy to my heart. Number one is praising God. And number two, seeing other people praise God. I love to see uh, the Lord's people in revelation to how free it is, what freedom it is to be able to worship and praise our Savior and what, that, what happens in our hearts and souls when we do that. It's like you're connecting with the very source of life. Amen? That's why we love to praise God at Deepwater's Tabernacle. I pray that you all become praisers. Amen? Worshipers of our Lord. If the people of God don't praise God, who's going to praise Him? The rocks will. The mountains will. But we shouldn't let them do it, right? Amen. Give him one more praise. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. My glasses got all excited and wanted to praise the Lord too. <laughs> At this moment, we're going to ask the children to start making their way to Children's Church, where they're going to learn their lesson about Jesus in a wonderful environment there. Amen. I want to speak to you uh, something that Lord laid on my heart. There are so many things in life that are necessary, so many things in life that are needed. But we need to know which ones are the most important, which ones we need to prioritize, and which one is the mo most important. You know, uh, back when my youngest son, Timmy, who got married in May... Uh, when he was giving birth, I was there. I was there for both of my son's birth. And uh, something happened that was quite scary to me was that as he was uh, coming out of the canal, he got stuck. On top of being stuck, he had the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. And he wouldn't come out. Time was of the essence because... He couldn't breathe. And the doctor, who was a good doctor, I don't know what happened, but he got so surprised that he took his hands off and he didn't know what to do. There was a head nurse in, in the room. She was a take charge kind of person. And what she did was she pushed the doctor out of the way. And she jumped on top of my wife and began to... Uh, she was on top of her. She began to punch and squeeze with all that was within her until Timmy popped out. His shoulder was caught. And then she cut the umbilical cord. But so much time had passed that when he came out, he was not breathing. He was completely blue. My wife was saying, why aren't you taking... She didn't know what was going on. I was as pale as a ghost. And she's saying, why aren't you taking pictures? And I, I didn't want to tell her why I wasn't taking pictures. But she kept asking, what's going on? What's going on? And I saw my son limp and not breathing. And at that moment, one of the best doctors was in the room. That nurse was an incredible nurse. I thank God for her that she was in the room. Mom was in the room. His dad was in the room. All important people that needed to be there. But at that moment, he didn't need a good doctor. 
He didn't need a good nurse. He didn't need his mom or dad. He needed one thing. He needed to breathe. He needed oxygen. And thank God, the, the, the testimony of that is that he, it went for five to seven minutes without him breathing. And you know what that means. But as we prayed, God kept him. And he's the one who's playing the worship up here. I think he got a little music while that was <laughs> happening. God put some music in him. But we thank God for that. So in the same way, there are very uh, many needs that we have as children of God to stay strong in our faith. And while there are many things that are important and that are needed, Jesus taught us that there's actually just one thing that we need. I'm going to read a story that is a very familiar story to all of us, but we're going to pull out some truth and some wisdom from God's word to see what the Lord is saying to us today. I'm reading from Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus was indicating to Mary and through this story to us that many things are needed, or a few things are needed, I should say, but really only one. What was the one thing that Mary was doing that was so important? It's very simple. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he said... To her, and he's saying to us today, there's only one thing that you actually need, and that is to sit at the feet of Jesus. I want to talk about what that signifies, what that means, what's the symbolism there, why is that so important? First of all, sitting at the feet of Jesus means that you're making his presence your priority. It means that you're making his presence your priority. Every day that you wake up, there are things that need to be done. There are routines that you need to follow. You need to get up. You need to take a bath. You need to get ready. You need to go to work or you need to go to school. There are things that immediately start pressing in on you that need to be done and that consume your time. It's easy to leave God out because of these pressing things. Martha was distracted. By many things, the Bible says. But you know what gets me about that? What was Martha distracted about? You know what she was actually doing? She was actually trying to prepare things for Jesus. She was trying to do things for him. But Jesus is here letting us know that she was distracted by those things. In other words, she was so busy trying to do something for him that she forgot the most important thing. You can get so busy doing things for Jesus, even that, that you can forget him. And that's dangerous. You know, I heard uh, last week, I think it was, very, very sad to me that a pretty well-known pastor in this area who had left, pastored a big church, uh, announced that he's leaving his wife and that he is no longer a Christian. How in the world does that happen? My second question is, why make an announcement about it? You know, why not go away quietly? But you know what, how that happens? By not making the presence of God your priority. You can get so busy even, quote, unquote, doing ministry that you're doing so many things for him that you forgot to sit with him and get everything that you need to do the very thing that you're doing. You can't do uh, uh, for, for God uh, more than you can be with him. That's not what God wants from us. 
He doesn't want busy work from us. As a matter of fact, he could do it all by himself. He allows us to participate so we can uh, uh, experience the joy that there is in doing that. But our main goal is to make his presence our priority. And just in the same way that Martha was distracted by so many things, we're distracted by so many things. What's the first thing we, cu we cut out when, when, when we're busy? What's the first thing? I'll tell you what it is. Our time with God. If you have it at all. Right? For those that do have a time, some people just get up and go on their way and hope for the best. I hope that many will hear my words today and change that. Because the most important thing in your life that will never change and that will keep you throughout your entire life is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. But when we get too busy, we cut that out. I love the psalmist David who said in Psalm 73, 28, I pray that this is all the way that we approach things. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. You know, when you're making the presence of God your priority, what you're really doing is making uh, your relationship with him your priority. You know what? I was speaking someplace yesterday at an opioid kind of crisis event, and they wanted, uh, I appreciated the people who organized it because they wanted to uh, inject the gospel into that because there's all things all kind of things you can do for people who are uh, addicted to things. But once they get clean, then what? If they don't have the one thing that's needed, Amen. you're going to be right back to that or to something else. Amen. Amen. But I appreciated that they wanted to inject Jesus, and that's what I was telling him. The one thing is a relationship with Jesus. It's what your soul craves for even if you don't know it. There is something in every single person that's longing for something. That's why we do things. That's why we look for things. That's why we get in trouble. That's why we go to substances. That's why we drink alcohol. That's why we go through things like uh, uh, things that we shouldn't do. I don't even want to mention them in this place. Everybody's searching for something. Maybe it's money. Maybe I need a lot of money. Maybe it's that. But then you get a lot of money and it's not enough. And you need more money. Then you get bored. Because you have too much money, you could buy whatever you want. And that's boring, believe it or not. And you're missing out on the one thing that's necessary. Sitting at his feet is making your relationship with him your priority. And by the way, you, you need him like I need him. I'm a mess without being near God. I'm a mess without being near God. I'm afraid of what I'll do when I'm not near God. I already know some things. How many have learned some things about yourself? It's almost like we're nut jobs without Christ. We do, we do some crazy, unexplainable things. Like what in the world? I look back sometimes at my life and I'm going, what, what in the world was I thinking? What in the world was I thinking? Thank God. I, you know, when we were singing that song, his mercy is more. My sins, they were many. How many are so thankful his mercy are more than all the sins? Can we give the Lord a praise offering for that? We should be coming out of our skin when we sing that. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. That's why I'm standing behind this platform and this, this pulpit. Not because I'm anything, but because his mercy was greater than everything I did wrong. When you sit at his feet, you're making his relationship with him your priority. You're also cultivating your love for God. Did you know that when you spend time with God, you cultivate love for him, you fall more in love with him? Now, that's not true with all people. Sometimes you, the more time you spend with certain people, the less you like them. But with God, the Bible says in so Song of Songs 516, he is altogether lovely. His divine glory is so attractive. But unless you see it, you won't understand and you won't be in love with the Lord Jesus. But when your eyes begin to open and you're around his glory, it attracts your heart. And you see that he is 
altogether lovely and it cultivates more of a love for God. Let me tell you, you want to be secure in your life. You want to do the right thing. You need to be in love with Jesus because he keeps you doing the right thing. Hallelujah. Not everybody sees it. You know, you ever see those art things that it's a mush of, of, of images? But in that image, if you look hard enough, there's something in there. There's a picture. Not everybody can see it. Only certain people can see it or concentrate to see. I love those because, you know, I, sometimes I, like, I have to look hard, but then I see the image. And that's how it is with the glory of God. You got to search for it. You got to look for it. But the good thing about it is, is that not, it, it's everybody can see it if you search. That's what the Bible says. Amen. So sitting at the feet of God is making being in his presence a priority. It's also, it, it signifies readiness to receive his word. You know, there's no better compliment that you can pay to a speaker than to be at rapt attention when they are speaking. You know, in all the times that I've been speaking in my life, sometimes um, I, I, I see people sleeping. I hope it's not that I'm that boring or that, you know, I, I say in my mind just to keep myself sane, ah, you know, they probably worked all night and haven't slept for five days. It's the only way they can fall asleep. <laughs> But, but a, a speaker, if you want to give respect, and I don't talk about me, but it is rapt attention. So sitting at the feet of Jesus signifies you're ready to hear what he has to say. Let me tell you something. What I have to say is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant that I have to say is what God says. I'm trying to commun communicate to you what God says, God helping me to do that. That's why this is so important. These are not my words. They're the words of the Lord Jesus. How many say amen? amen? So sitting at his feet, you're listening. Martha was distracted. Mary realized that there were many distractions and worries that she could have had, but she had the Savior in front of her, and she was not budging. There were preparations to be made, food to be cooked, pots to be washed. But she said, you know what? We'll get to that. Right now, my Savior is here. You know, uh, when, when we begin to praise the Lord and the beautiful presence, God manifests his presence in so many ways. But sometimes he manifests his presence in a way that you got to stop, right? And, and you can't move from that spot. That's why we don't put a time element on worship. How am I going to put God time? You know, sometimes I go to speak somewhere and they say, you have 30 minutes. Am I going to tell God that? God, you're going to move? You got five minutes. <laughs> well, you know what? It sounds silly, doesn't it? But you know what? There are places that actually do that. They don't know they're saying that. As a matter of fact, they don't even give them five. You look down to the minute, they have things, you know, opening prayer, one minute. Well, how do you know it's going to be one minute? How do you know that God's not going to move on and you're going to begin to pray? Right? Uh, opening remarks, 30 seconds. First song, four minutes. And then there's a countdown clock to worship. And when that count down clock reaches zero, you stop. Nowhere in the Bible do I find that anywhere. I was just reading about, I'm in 2 Chronicles, and I'm up to the part where they brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, and all the musicians started to play, the lyres and the cymbals and the trumpets, and all the people, all the people of God were there. Can you imagine? They began to sing and praise the Lord. Can you imagine the roar? And what they were singing is, God is good, for he is good, and his love endures forever. And at that moment, the, the people of God made a lot of mistakes, but at that moment, the people were doing it the right way. They were so excited that they were able to have the Ark of the Covenant finally come into Jerusalem, into a temple that was built especially for him. Before that, he had dwelled in tents, and he was fine with that. He said, he told 
David, I, I've never asked you to build anything for me, a building for me. But they were so excited to have done that. And so was Solomon. And at that moment, they were worshiping in spirit and in truth. And the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord came and filled that temple. It said that the priests couldn't do their service. And I was thinking about that. What if God came in here? If we were all praising God with all of our heart, I believe that God would interrupt this service. I believe that I wouldn't even be able to get up here. I believe that he would fill this temple and we would all be on our knees praising and glorifying God and forgetting about what time it is or what game we have to watch on TV or what show is on. Readiness for his word. Romans 10, 17 says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of, about Christ. And when you're ready to listen to his words, you're ready to hear his instructions. It gives you a readiness to follow his instructions. You know, before you serve, you have to know if God is asking you to do that. You need his instructions about what he wants you to do and how he wants you to do it. We kind of do what we want, don't we? We don't stop for our instructions. But God is leading us, if we will hear, to do what he wants us to do. And to receive that leading, you need to sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen? So it's a readiness to receive his work. Also sitting at his feet signifies submission. Think of that picture of somebody is talking and somebody's sitting at their feet in rapt attention. That's a picture of submission. What are you submitting to? Submitting to his word. Submitting to it. It's one thing to hear it. It's another to submit to it. How about this? Submitting to his lordship. There's one thing that we need to get right. A lot of us got the Savior part right. It's good to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. How many are thankful that you're saved, that Jesus Christ is your Savior? His mercy is more. Our sins have been forgiven. But there's another part to it. You have to receive him as Lord. And that we're not so quick to do. Because that means that somebody else gets to tell you what to do. That means that your plans are out the window. That means that what you thought your life was going to be, you are going to lay aside. If someone is your Lord, if someone is your master, then you don't do what you want. You do what that master, what that Lord is telling you to do. Now, the great news about that is that God is good and his love endures forever and that he loves you. And his plan, by the way, blows your plan away by to smithereens. There's nothing that you can think of that's better than what God has thought of for you. Nothing at all. It's proven by, if, if I give many of you the microphone who are following Christ, you would say the same thing. I was on one road, and goodness gracious, I don't want to be back on that road. I got saved. God put me on another road, and I'm not moving from here. Whatever God has, that's what I want to do. We had to learn that, right? But there's a resistance to Jesus Christ as Lord, especially today in the church of God. We got to kind of telling God what to do. And by the way, you think you're telling God what to do. He's not listening. You think that you have a little program and you're going to do it your way, but God's not showing up. That's why in so many places you can go to church and you, you, you can have what you can do whatever you want and you won't sense the presence of God anywhere near the place because they programmed him out. There's no time for God. We got to do things about God. Now look what you did. You got me all riled up. <laughs> Psalm 16, verse 2. Listen, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. What if that were all of our attitude? I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Can you say that? You are my Lord. 
Lord. Say it again. You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Say it again. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Oh, it's so good to declare Jesus Christ Lord of our lives and to hear what his plan for our lives is. You know what? I am nowhere close to doing what I thought I'd be doing for the rest of my life. Nowhere close. God took me in a totally different direction. I, I never aspired to be in ministry. It was not my idea. But here I am. And I'm not happy because I am a pastor. I'm happy because I am in the will of God. Whether I was doing this or anything else, as long as I know. I was talking to the Lord the other day. I'm going to let you in. Know, you know, I usually don't do this. But I was praying, God, here, here's what would make me the happiest. This is what I learned. All I want is to be in your will. That's it. Whatever that is, would you keep me there? That's when I'll have peace and joy and, and, and I'm, I'm ready to go. Because I know his will. Listen, his will is perfect. Why would I want something imperfect when I can have something perfect? His will is perfect. That's all I want to do. And that's all that we should want to do. Amen? Amen. So sitting at his feet also means submission. Sitting at his feet signifies dependence. Depending on God. That's another thing that we need to learn a thing or two about. Psalm 16.5. Psalmist there says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. So the question for you and me is, who makes your lot secure? Who are you confident in? Who are you depending on? Are you depending on your job? You got a good job? You're depending on somebody else. You're depending on your husband. You're depending on your wife. You should be able to depend on each other, but not for the things that only God can give. Who are you depending on? What are you trusting in? Things? Resources? What is it? Money? If you're depending on anything but God, you're chasing after the wind, like Solomon said. Learn from somebody. You're going to learn from somebody. Learn from Solomon. He had everything you're looking for. Everything. Anything you could think of that you want, Solomon had it. And at the end of the day, he said, it was like chasing after the wind. You know, I wasn't planning to say this, but I've said it before. I, I was sharing yesterday at this crisis thing, the opioid crisis thing, about an actor by the name of Shia LaBeouf. He, he's famous for the Transformers movies, if you know what that is. And at the time, there's an a, a article on, uh, on the internet uh, from uh, an interview that Parade Magazine did. It's not a Christian magazine. And they were interviewing this young man. He was 23 at the time. Because he was the most successful and most money-making person in his genre at that time. He had made 3 to $4 billion for the movie industry. And he was just 23 years old. But he was a mess up. And his latest escapade had been that he had... Uh, uh, got into uh, 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 his SUV and was driving so crazy that he went off the road and his car flipped over three times and he escaped with his life by the miracle of God. And then he was talking some things. He goes, why am I this way? Why am I an alcoholic? I don't know. And then he says, you know, we actors, you can look it up. Trade Magazine, Shia, Shia LaBeouf. Why um, our actors are, are, we're very insecure, and I don't know why. You know, it's like I have a God-sized hole, and if I knew how, I'd fill it, and I'd be on my way. He's still messed up to this day, because he hasn't figured out how to fill a God-sized hole. Wow. Let me ask you, how do you fill a God-sized hole? There's only one way to fill a God-sized hole, and it's with God. That hole is there for everybody. Everybody has an empty space in your soul, 
And if you don't fill it with God, you will look to fill it with something else. That's what all the mess is, all the chaos in the world. It's people who don't know Jesus trying to fill this longing in their soul that only one person could fill. Nothing else can do it. It's been proven down through the ages, but we keep trying because the last one we want to turn to is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that's the truth, the only one that can fill that void. He's the only one that you can depend on. And sitting at his feet is your dependence on him. Don't depend on something else. Depend on the Lord Jesus. How many say amen? Amen. Then I want to finish with this. Timmy, if you would come. Sitting at the feet of Jesus signifies discipleship. Again, another word that is not very active in Christianity today. I don't even know what, Christ, what, what being a Christian means today. Because a lot of people are Christians in other senses. You could be a political Christian, or you could be a cultural Christian, or some other kind of Christian and serve some other kind of Jesus. But there's only one kind of disciple, those that follow the truth, amen, because the truth is the only thing that can set us free. We have presented the gospel as another thing to put on our, on our to-do list instead of presenting it for what it really is, a way of life. Jesus isn't something else to do on Sunday, And hopefully on Tuesday, if you pray, that's not what this is all about. It was about an invasion of your life, of a God coming into your life and changing everything about the way you do things, the way that you speak, the way that you uh, act, the way that you are with your husband, with your wife, the way that you are with your children, the way that you are at your job, the way you treat people who don't treat you so nice. It changes everything about you. Your speech is changed. Your way of thinking is changed. The way you see the world is changed. The way you see people is changed. The way you love changes. It changes everything. It's a revolutionary kind of thing. Discipleship means following Jesus wherever he leads you. And whatever he instructs you to do, doing that. Let me tell you what a disciple does. A disciple puts the Lord Jesus above everything else, above anybody else and everything else. Luke 14, 33, the Lord speaking, the Lord Jesus said, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. I wish people would tell us the truth like that. You won't hear that too much. But that's what Jesus said. If you're not willing to give up everything you have, then you cannot be his disciple. Let me give you a little hint about everything that you have. It's worth nothing. If you have everything but don't have Jesus, you have what's going to rust, what's going to get ruined, what's going to be on the ash heap one day. That's what you have. So you're really giving up nothing to get everything. And by the way, when you have Jesus, the Bible tells us that if you seek first the kingdom of God, then those things that you are running after, they'll come following behind you. It's just that they won't be your God anymore. You won't be living for those things anymore. And if you have them or you don't have them, it doesn't much matter as long as you have Jesus and he's bringing you through this life because we're going to see him one day. We're just passing through here. A disciple is a student of the word of God. You got to know what this word says. And please, please, Know what it says here so that you won't be led astray. There's so many things that so many people say that sound about right. But if you don't know your word, it's actually off. Because they put a little truth in with whatever they're mixing it. And you can't mix the gospel with anything else. It's forbidden. You can't add to it and you can't take away from it. 
It is complete. And some fine sounding preacher on TV might say some things that tickles your ear. And it might sound like a shortcut to get into God. But there is no shortcut other than seeking him with all your heart. Those are the people that find seeking you will find knock and the door will be open. Know your word. Study to show yourself approved as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. So a disciple puts the Lord above all things. A disciple is a student of the word of God. A disciple lives in obedience to the word of God. How important is that? How do you prove your love to Jesus? Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will do what? Yes, you will keep my, if you love, there's an if there. If you love me, this is what you'll do. This is how you'll prove it. You will keep my commandments. There's no other kind of Christianity. You know, those guys that are a little, you know, they do everything Jesus says. And then there's the normal Christians who, you know, try their best. There's no such thing. Listen, Jesus is telling us to do something because he wants to empower you to do it. He knows we can't. How many have found out you can't? But see, that's the whole plan is, why do you think he sent the Holy Spirit? To li actually live in you. Did you? Do you understand that? That the Holy Spirit comes to live in you so that you can do then what you couldn't do before. Amen. That you can live this word. You know why? If he's in control, he has no problem living the word. He proved it while he was here on earth. Him living in you, he'll live the word through you. What an awesome thing that is. There's two ways of living. I've lived them both. I've, I've said I was a Christian messing up. And when I did a little inventory, there were some things missing. Missing. I wasn't eating. I wasn't reading the Word of God. I wasn't praying the way I should. Then wondering why I couldn't live the Word of God. How silly of me. We live in obedience. A disciple... Here's, here's what, a disciple bears fruit. That's how you know a disciple. Their life will bear fruit. John 15, 8, Jesus speaking, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves what? To be my disciples. That's what distinguishes a disciple. When you meet a disciple anywhere, he is causing a ruckus wherever he is. If you're at the job in an ungodly place and you're a disciple, you're causing a ruckus. People can't figure you out. People will want to change you. They'll even come against you. But then when they're in trouble, they will run to you. Listen, people can say what they say, but they know light when they see it. They know where to run when they get in trouble. disciple lives a life of prayer. There's no such thing as a Christian that doesn't pray. No such thing. You can't follow Jesus and not talk to him. Can't be a follower or disciple of someone and not ever speak to them. Or just thank him for food once in a while. What if that's the only relationship I had with my sons? They never spoke to me. Thanks for the sandwich, Dad. Bye. That's my prayer life. Thanks for the Chipotle. No, there's a relationship there. That, that, that's what makes them my children, my sons. And as sons and daughters of God, there's a relationship there. And we're supposed to talk and communicate with God. He's right there. He's not far. He's the closest thing. You know, as close as I am to my wife, she's my best friend. No one's closer than Jesus because she doesn't live in me. He knows my every secret and he still loves me. He knows your every secret and he still loves you more than you can imagine. A disciple also fellowships with other believers. You long to be with other people of God. You long to be with people that love Jesus like you do. Right, Moana? 
She was sharing with me yesterday. Can't wait to be with the family of God tomorrow. Yeah, I feel the same way. I can't wait. I can't wait. And not because I'm pastoring now. That was me when I was back in church. I was a part of a, a wonderful church where the presence of God was. I couldn't wait to get there. You couldn't keep me out. Let me tell you what happens to a disciple who sits at the feet of Jesus. You sit at the seat, sit at Jesus as, at the feet of Jesus as, as a disciple. You have entered through the right gate. Because Jesus is the gate, John 10, 9. And let me tell you something. The Bible says that the gate is small. And it says that very few people find it. There are few that find it. If you are sitting at his feet, you have found the small gate. And you should be ever so joyful about that. When you sit at his feet, you're not only in the right gate, you're on the narrow road. Because Jesus is the way. How many ways are there that lead to life? There's only one, and Jesus is it. And when you sit at his feet, you are on the right way. John 14, 6. When you sit at his feet, you're in the light. Because Jesus is the light. You know, I'm wearing these glasses because after a certain age, I think it's 40, your eyes stop focusing. I can see really well, but I, my eyes don't focus anymore. But you get me in the sunlight, and I could put these away. I could see in the light. It's amazing. And it's awesome to be able to see what you can't see when you're in the light that Jesus sheds. Sit at his feet, you'll be in the light. John 8, 12. You sit at his feet, you live according to truth. I love living according to truth. You know why you live according to truth? Because Jesus is the truth. He's the truth. You're looking for truth? Sitting at his feet, you found the truth. John 14, 6. You live the life that is truly life sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know why? Because he is the life. John 14, 6 again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you sit at Jesus' feet, you won't go hungry because Jesus is the bread of life. You will be spiritually filled until you see him face to face, John 6, 35. When you're sitting at Jesus' feet, you are staying connected to the vine because Jesus is the vine. And when you are connected to the vine, then all the resources of the vine, all of the energy of the vine, all of the strength of the vine flows through you because you are connected to the vine. Jesus is the vine, John 15, 5. And finally, when you sit at Jesus' feet, you will experience resurrection because Jesus is the resurrection. John eleven twenty five. You know what? You know why it's the, the one thing that you need? <laughs> because if you do that one thing, if you live your life sitting at the feet of Jesus, everything else that you need, everything else that you need to do, what your purpose is, what your life will be, will emanate from that position. Everything that you could possibly want that won't harm you, you will receive sitting at the feet of Jesus. You want God's will in your life because it's perfect? You'll get it sitting at the feet of Jesus. You want to know what your purpose is? You'll understand it sitting at the feet of Jesus. Are you feeling a little weak? You'll get his strength sitting at the feet of Jesus. Have you begun to lose your peace because so many unpeaceful things are happening around you and there's chaos? You will receive your peace back at the feet of Jesus because he's the prince of peace. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Hallelujah talking about sitting at the feet of Jesus and that starts with a relationship and the Bible says whosoever will may come no one's left out 
who wants a relationship with Jesus. If you're here today and you need a relationship with Jesus, you perhaps never invited him to be your Savior, Lord, or maybe maybe you did and you walked away and God is speaking to your heart today, I'd like to pray with you. If, if that's you and the Lord is speaking to your heart, if you could let me know who you are by raising your hand, I'd love to pray with you. Is there someone here? Yes, I see your hand here. Yes, I see your hand here to my right. Thank you. Anybody else who needs to start a relationship or restore their relationship with Jesus? Raise your hand. Don't leave here without it. Yes, I see your hand here in my back to my left. I see your hand here up front. Thank you. One more moment. Anybody else that says, yes, I need, I need to do that. I need to fix my relationship with Jesus. Amen. If you raised your hand to receive Christ or to come back to Christ, I want you to pray this prayer. I'm going to say the words. You repeat them. God will hear you. Make it your prayer. I'm just going to help you with some words. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that although my sins are many, your mercy is more. Thank you, Lord, for this moment. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose on the third day, God, and that you are the resurrection and the life. Today, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life as Lord and Savior. I give you my heart in Jesus' name. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for these that you have spoken to privately, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that, Father, there's no one that you turn away. Thank you, Lord, that these that are raised their hands are now children of God. There's no uh, waiting period, Lord. There's no qualifications. All we need is a, a willing heart. And so, Lord, we celebrate, oh, Lord God, salvation today in this place and ask you to cover each person, oh, God, that from here, from this point on, God, they would know you, that they would sit at your feet, that they would receive your word, oh, God, that they would learn, oh, God, of what your plan for their lives are. It's a good plan, a plan based on your love for them. God, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads still bowed and eyes closed, I know there are many believers here, but maybe life has gotten you all distracted, and Jesus is speaking to your heart today, saying, come, you know what, those things are necessary, but it's not the one thing that you need, and you just want to ask God for special grace today. Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. Yes, yes, all over the building. Yes. Father, we confess that we need you, Lord. Father, you see all these hands that are raised, oh God. Lord, life has so many distractions. It has happened to me also, oh Lord God, in the past. And God, I want you to keep us aware, oh God. Keep your children aware, oh God. That Lord, the first thing, God, when we wake up, God, that you will have it so that, Lord, you're the first thing on our minds and on our hearts, oh God, that we will learn, oh God, to run to your throne of grace, Lord God, at the beginning of the day to say how much we need you to connect with you, oh God, ask you for strength for our day, oh God, that no matter what comes our way, oh God, or, or, or the world, when it starts spinning around us, oh God, that you would be a rock that we stand on, oh God, on firm and solid ground, oh Lord Jesus. God, that we will speak to you throughout the day, not just in the morning, oh God. That we will whisper prayers, oh God, in our thoughts, oh God. And even sometimes when we're alone out loud, oh God, speaking to you, Lord God, with all kinds of prayers and requests, Lord Jesus, that you will be the most important thing, the most important person in our life, oh God, so that we can live the life that is truly life, like it says in your word. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts today. I ask you to cover your children, oh God. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand and give God a clap offering of glory and praise?